Hey, thanks for joining on Communicate Like You Give a Damn. I have a very cool guest <laughs> who actually the way we crossed paths, Miriam, was I think you just reached out to me on LinkedIn and maybe like asked me a question or you wanted to, you know, you wanted to get together for a minute. And I ended up like listening more to you and fascinated by your background and your perspective of what was what's going on in the world. And that's when I was drafting uh, the conscious communicator, my, my chapters for the conscious communicator book. And I thought, I think she has a really interesting perspective that can be added to the book. And it just turned into this whole thing. Like, I'm sure like the, when you just reached out to me cold on LinkedIn, it wasn't something that you expected that you would end up as a contributing author in a book. <laughs> Not by any means, but it was, it was such a fortunate circumstance. And I'm so glad that, you know, we met and the rest has been history. <laughs> so I've gotten to know you over the time that since we've originally connected, uh, but let, introduce yourself to our, our audience. Yeah. So my name is Miriam Khalifa. I am a Bay Area native, Oakland, born and raised, still here. Uh, and I am a DEI strategist and research enthusiast who believes in the power of communications to create change. Oh, I love it. So tell us about your path. Like, how did you get into DEI? Kind of what was the, the pulling vision for you? Uh, and what's your background? Yeah. So, you know, I've always felt this kind of innate sense of injustice in the world and almost like a, a responsibility to see how I can, you know, make life better for people, um, people of all walks of life. And so, you know, the past few years, I've really been focused on creating equitable opportunity for underserved communities, primarily through corporate strategy, um, but also through public policy. So I'm currently building data-driven DEI and change management strategies, primarily for finance and other private sector clients, um, as well as doing research on how to increase equitable impact for underrepresented talent and how companies can better support them. But prior to DEI, uh, I was doing political research and public opinion polling, which was really centered around gaining insights that shape messaging strategy. So for polling, this often was for public policy and, you know, big NGO campaigns. Uh, and then I later on did the same thing for congressional and presidential campaigns, where we know messaging is everything. And how did you get interested in that? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> You know, I, I think that I feel, I've always felt politics is, you know, the kind of center of, of who we are as a nation and opportunity and, and experience, you know, should be equitable for everyone here because, you know, we're, we're American citizens. And I think that I was drawn to policy because I saw that this is a way to create widespread change um, and reach, touch, you know, so many lives through, through a simple thing like communication strategy. Um, the impact is, is really magnified. And what I'll say is that it has been a winding path through that, um, working on various types of campaigns. You know, initially, the polling that I was focused on was, was very much around um, social issues. So reproductive rights, environmental justice, oftentimes touchy subjects that are hard for, you know, public discourse to really kind of wrap its head around and, and move forward on just because of how things, pol uh, how polarized things were. Mm -hmm. And so the power of, you know, messaging strategy and, and really public opinion research as a whole is, that you're able to tap into the values of the people you want to reach and understand how do I get them where I want them to be? How do I be most effective in what I'm doing here? Whether that's, you know, to turn out the votes, to get people to, to see, you know, think differently about what it means to be pro-life, you know, you name it. Um, but I was really drawn to that idea of we can shape 
the future of this country just by the way that we message to people and by the way that we are able to speak to them and what they care about. So there's a lot of skill set around persuasion and influence. And a lot of that has to do with speaking the language of your targeted audience. And to your point, tapping in to the values and, and, and what, what it is that they value. It's not, we're not talking about company values like that sit on a badge or a lovely poster in the break rooms. This is genuine people's like what they value and, and the values that they stand for in their life and being able to relate to them in that way. Now, the, what you contributed to the end of the habitual uh, chapter. So the depth model is five pillars, D-E-P-T-H, deliberate, educated, purposeful, tailored, and habitual. And so we put you at the end of the habitual chapter because the title of your work is Communications for Social Impact, more than a slogan. So it's not like you're in, you're out right? It's not a one-off. That's not what this work is about. So as a DEI strategist who really values and understands the power of communication, what in this article, and feel free to read some if you'd like, uh, what is the key takeaway that you hope that the audience would get from this work? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Happy to share, you know, a few little clips that I think kind of embody the message I was trying to get across. As a former public opinion and political researcher, I learned a lot about the time and thought that goes into a campaign's messaging strategy. Public opinion polling falls under the broader category of market research, which is used to inform campaigns on what will win over their audiences, whether that be a product launch or an election. The goal of market research is to understand your audience segments and their values. This information informs the campaign on how it can tap into those values using communications regardless of whether the goal is to sell a product or get constituents to learn and care about an issue and then vote on it. Companies use market research to inform their ad campaigns and generate sales, and candidates can win elections based on their messaging. It's time for organizations to utilize similar strategies for the social causes they speak on. They're serious about going up beyond performative communications and want to make progress. Companies can instead use their platforms to create and reinforce positive impact. So I think that kind of sums up the gist of my point. Um, and you know, it, it really is that it's about taking the time to be authentic, intentional, and like you said, habitual. It's not you know, releasing a statement willy nilly or as kind of a response to something that's happening. It's really about you know, thinking through your company's values, your company's priorities and our track record before speaking on an issue and asking yourself, you know, is this something that we have consistently prioritized and been, you know, public about? Or are we responding to a current trend or maybe even responding to backlash because we didn't speak out initially? Um, you know, and then lastly, asking yourself, one, can we live up to what we're saying? And two, is it in line with the brand that we're building and everything that we plan to do going forward? That last line as well kind of, you know, sums up, hey, like conscious and habitual communications can do more than just communicate follow through on your company's commitments. They can also enhance accountability and increase likelihood of actually achieving your goals once you've put that out there. And when crafted well, they have the power to reinforce and reinvigorate your company's missions and values by tying those to tangible actions that people can do beyond the company. That's definitely something I want to follow up with you. First, you know, you, you talked about, you know, the, the whole part of the title talking about more than a slogan. One of the things, and, and you, you expanded upon that and what you just shared, one of the things that I've seen consistently from brands who don't do social cause messaging well is that they may say, and even have the CEO say in, an, in a formal statement, we stand with the LGBTQ plus community, or we stand with the black community, and we stand with dot, dot, dot. But then when you see their actions there, and uh, they are actually folding when there's any kind of a whiff of a pushback for some, some takes a little bit more of a pushback or, you know, you know, 
a louder pushback or a longer pushback, but they eventually still fold. So what I'm seeing here is this, this gap of say and do where we'll say that we stand with the community, but we're not able to withstand the, the pushback the you know, because we don't have the legs underneath it. We don't have the strength uh, positionally from a reputation standpoint and the work behind it to really have the teeth to show that we understand what we're saying and this is how we're backing it up and we're going to withstand this storm, if you will, um, and get through it and continue to be with the community that we are advocating for because these folks are our customers. These folks are our employees and we are going to stand with them and withstand any pressure uh, to create a division between us and this community in our customer and employee base. So there's, there's a great opportunity for brands to actually withstand and not allow the division on their watch. Um, you're a DEI strategist. You've talked about equitable impact. Um, and there's a lot of folks who are interested in DEI measurement. That was something else that you mentioned as well. So if you could help us kind of understand as a DEI strategist, what do you see as the role of communications? How do you help communications further equitable outcomes? And do you measure it? How do you, and, and if so, how do you measure it? Great questions. So yeah, communications is actually a, a really, really fundamental part of, you know, DEI strategy um, and rollout. And oftentimes, I think communications, it, it's <laughs> required throughout the entire process, but where it becomes really, really crucial is that last piece where, hey, you know, and, and data, I think, kind of flows through this as well. So the way that I think about this and, and the way that um, you know, I've done this work is you start by evaluating where you're at. You, you can't make progress if you don't know what to benchmark to and, and what you're working with, what the underlying issues are. And that's often the time where you first start looking at the numbers, right? Okay, so we can say that, you know, everyone's happy working here or that we have a great team and we all get along super well, but when you look, you know, <laughs> by the numbers, where is that representation? You know, where are your underrepresented employees? Are they all coming in as second year talent and then leaving by their third year and cycling through? You know, are they, are they in decision-making roles? Um, how, how much, you know, effect are they able to have on the culture? Are their voices heard when they have issues? Um, and I think really looking kind of the structure of an organization is a great way to benchmark and to work forward, especially when you're thinking about, you know, <laughs> DEI, I think, can be very intangible at times. Like, how do you put a metric on someone's feelings, right? But you can survey them and you can say, this is what we're hearing right now. Let's come back. And it, it may not even be, you know, as a consultant, I may not be there, in two years when that survey takes place again and they have done the work and they have, you know, invested time and money and been patient to see that follow through. But if you come back in two years, you should be able to see, hey, we had 46% of our folks saying that they feel when they raise a concern that it is taken seriously and, you know, things are being done about it. Two years later, you should see a noticeable increase. And so I think being, you know, realistic about, hey, what can we measure? And then doing everything you can to get there is a really important piece of this um, that's often overlooked. And once you understand where you're at, then you build the strategy for how to get where you want to go. And that's where, you know, communications becomes really important because you can, you know, work with senior leaders, build as much strategy as you want, but if they don't have the tools and the change management um, the implementation, you know, to really get this on the ground and get everyone on board. Like they're, they're not the one, you know, senior leaders are not the people executing on this. You need your managers to understand and be on board. They need to be consistently informed and, and, you know, able to have a two-way communication channel of, I understand this is where we're trying to go. 
I'm having some issues here. How do I work through this? They need, you know, playbooks. They need scripts. They need to be able to talk to this to their own employees. And I think that that's where this, you know, communications is really kind of the make or break point because strategy is very pie in the sky and we can have the best ideas to make everything perfect, but without that change management piece, it's not going to go anywhere. Great point. Great point. Uh, you were talking about working with leaders and executives. And when we tie that to your piece within the Conscious Communicator book, but also your experience in working as a political strategist, et cetera, what are some of the similarities and differences between the politicians and, and how strat strategic messaging is used in order to garner votes and ultimately meet the goal of having that person, that candidate uh, elected versus is there, is there any kind of a similarity or a difference when we're talking about our CEO and engaging our CEO? Are there things that we can learn from the political messaging strategy process that we can apply to engage our CEOs tapping into diversity, equity, inclusion, communicating about it and the values that are important to uh, our employee and our customer base. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from political, you know, communications and the, just the way um, that they operate these campaigns. When, you know, coming into that world, um, I think the, the piece that took me aback was just how much dedication there is, how much time is invested. Um, you know, this is, these are months long research projects, sometimes even, you know, years, not, it's not like, oh yeah, just, we think this sounds good. We think this will resonate with who hopefully the people are going to vote for us. You know, there's such an investment into um, time, you know, and money and time that goes into discovering how they can most effectively use messaging to reach their desired outcomes. And then once they figure that out, they're very, very strategic on not only, you know, understanding our audiences is many different groups combined with their own, you know, their own values, their own opinions, and how do we, you know, best reach those different groups to gain buy-in from everyone that is on the table for us. And I think that, you know, oftentimes we see companies investing that same time, those same resources um, into what, what would be considered market research, but mostly when it comes to, you know, finding product market fit or driving sales. Um, and where companies oftentimes diverge from political communications is when it comes to social impact issues. You know, whether we're calling that ESG, DEI, doesn't matter. Um, we've often seen, you know, especially since 2020, companies are kind of rushing to put something out, saying whatever sounds good, um, reacting as opposed to being proactive and showing that this is a long-term commitment for them. You know, not laying the groundwork to say, here's what we've done so far, and this is why we care, and this is why we're releasing this statement, um, and not being consistent. It's kind of, oh, we said it, that should be enough, and then mm -hmm. yeah, and everyone forgets. What more do you want from us? We said it. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and I really I appreciate that because that, that's part of the habit is, is being habitual, not just on the surface level of talking about it, but actually showing the work because one of, the, one of our superpowers as communicators is visibility can drive accountability. Yep, exactly. And I think that, you know, it's, it's sad because what we've seen as a result of the way companies have handled this so far um, is, you know, they're releasing performative communications that at times even contradict the company values and their track record completely. Um, but ultimately, you know, you can get backlash from your, your customers, your employees, because they see through this. And not only have you lowered, you know, their trust and their confidence in the validity of the work you say you're doing or the causes you say you care about, 
But it's also a discredit to, you know, ESG and, and DEI work as a whole. People see it as toothless when over and over, this is the trend. I really am so glad that you pointed out, well, everything that you've been saying, and specifically the investment of political campaigns on research. What do people care about? How do we message to that? What's going to win us that election? So if our executives, if our CEO was that politician to you know, align with employees and customers at that level, the level of research and understanding our employees and what's important to our employees, what's important from a values base, because that's what you're talking about, is the, the values of this of the base that they're trying to move, persuade, influence, to vote for that person. It's, an, it's like any relationship where every day we need to have them choose their partner. Every day we want employees to choose that job. And every time that we're doing political campaign messaging, we want that person to choose ultimately that candidate when it comes time to vote. But that we're... I haven't seen a lot of that, Miriam, where there's this level of investment and understanding that we have to understand our employees so well to understand what's genuinely important to them, the months of research, the dedication, the, the importance of understanding the connection, which is the objective of communication, is that connection uh, between sender and receiver we're seeing it from a political standpoint. They understand what's at stake. Millions of dollars are spent, right? But we don't see a similar commitment uh, and process within companies that, to your point, we could really learn from. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's actually, you know, <laughs> employees, you know, the that is that is what the value of a company. You know, if they lose their employees, they they have nothing. Um, but I think, you know, especially for folks who, if you're expecting anyone in your company to actually feel committed to what you're saying and to maybe even be in charge of rolling it out and doing some <laughs> some work for you, so that it isn't just you know, hey, a statement and then that's it. Those people need. <laughs> extreme, you know, they need to be bought in like no other. They need to see that you're invested. They need to see that this goes all the way up to the top. And you also need to be thinking about, you know, different, the different audiences that you have um, and the information that they need at different cadences to be successful and to be kept in the loop. It's not the same for everyone. And you are going to be talking to, you know, your customers about the work that you're doing for Black Lives Matter or what have you very differently than the folks who you're expecting to launch some type of, you know, campaign around and have the company say, this is the work we're doing and expect them to execute on it. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we are in quite a historical moment, uh, given the social context, you were just talking about that, referring to the climate that we're in, where do you see communications needing to go and understanding the importance of, of communications as a key component of any kind of successful efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusion within organizations? Where do you, where do you see thing, you know, organizational communications needing to go in order to show up and step up in this incredible time in history? Yeah. You know, I think we have started seeing some companies really reflect <laughs> and, and take a look at themselves and say, you know what, instead of just releasing a statement on some headline that we know everyone is upset about and expects us to say something on, you know, how have we either contributed to the sol uh, solution or the problem, you know, and, and owning that. And really saying, hey, you know, if we're speaking about um, LGBTQ rights, then, you know, we need to look at ourselves and say, do we have a track record to contributing, you know, or lobbying for candidates who are the ones passing these measures? And, you know, really kind of taking a step back, taking the, the PR lens off of things 
and just be real with people. Because at this point, you know, <laughs> trust is key. And like you said, I think there, there has been a lot of trust lost just in the way that these instances have been handled by companies. Um, and it's really time to just say, you know, let's, <laughs> let's just be real. We know that we have things to work on. And then speaking about what you're planning on doing. And, you know, I, I will say, I think this is a difficult time um, given, you know, being in the Bay Area, we know tech companies have laid off, you know, tens of thousands of employees. Um, we were, market conditions are, are kind of uncertain. And I think it's understandable to not constantly have results to show. And that's why it's even more important to just say, okay, you know, maybe we have had to pause the work that we were so public about and so proud of when we launched in 2021. Um, but being honest and saying, you know what, this is where we're at. Here's where we have to go. Here's maybe why we haven't been able to make change or, you know, here's maybe even we have to lay off our DI team, give the reasoning, talk about, you know, what are we going to do once we're able to and seeing this as, as not just a transactional relationship, but something that you have to invest in to regain folks' trust and to get them to see nobody's perfect, but that the effort is there and it's real. Great. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> there's quite a few things that went through my head as you were answering uh, different kinds of conversations I've had with clients. And where I will uh, go is towards <laughs> something that we're ramping into, which is the next United States presidential election, mm -hmm. where there are candidates who have created a narrative tapping into the values of their base using language that creates division, that creates an us versus them, you know, language such as woke you know, uh, being very committed to anti-woke culture when woke isn't a thing, you know? So language is being weaponized in such a way that it is manufacturing problems and stirring people up, firing people up, all for the political gain of the person getting additional, you know, these candidates, additional power. And so, it's often, you know, said that when candidates invent a culture war or tap into a low-lying culture war and then bring it to the surface and add a lot of fuel to the fire, they don't have any other kind of political plan or social impact kind of plan. What are we doing about jobs, climate, <laughs> healthcare, you know, but we're going to talk about not having bathrooms available for transgender people. You know, and that's, that's where the millions of dollars of donations are going to and that these are the biggest problems is making sure that there's not drag queens near kids, which is a classic political move is like we have to protect the kids that stokes this fear. So language is being weaponized in a political system that is driving division within our society, but also within our businesses. So it's an interesting time to just not just watch, we have to do something. And, and I'd love to hear if you have some advice for organizations who are on the effect or the impact, impacted side of these, the rhetoric of this narrative where I know as a DEI communicator, when someone says, you know, everyone keeps talking about they don't want this woke culture. And I said, it doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's an illusion. And so this battle of words that we're seeing play out created from a political standpoint for political power and gain, but organizations are, to your earlier point, reactive right now. They are woefully unprepared for handling the narrative and, and regaining the narrative to get to that point of withstanding, if you will, do you have any advice on that as we enter into probably the most contentious presidential election in recent history? Yeah, 
Thank you for that. It's it's a very interesting question. You know, typically I'm <laughs> in, you know, kind of processing, oh, like what should, if I was still in politics, you know, where do I think um, the messaging and, and where do I think there are missed opportunities uh, that need to be addressed? And people don't usually ask about, you know, hey, as as a private sector, you know, business, how should I be responding to these things? Um, and I think it does go back to looking at, at yourself. You know, we've, we've had this conversation of we're seeing these companies with all these statements. Meanwhile, they're, if you go and look at their, you know, lobbying, their donation history, we know not only are they not doing anything for the cause they're speaking about, they're actually a part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And I think that companies like that need to take a hard look at themselves. And there, there may be companies who say, you know what, we're taking a, a political stance on this. We donate to these candidates. That's the values that we're going to uphold. And that should be a very clear sign to anyone who is or is planning on working there to say, are these my values? Is this an environment I want to be in? Maybe not. And, and knowing that, you know, out the gate before accepting that offer. Um, I think for, you know, companies who maybe have their heart in the right place, but are nervous to take a stand, it's really, like you said, it's about stepping back and realizing that basic language has been weaponized. Um, basic human rights have been, you know, turned into partisan issues and you don't have to, you know, choose Democrat or Republican as a company to be able to take a stand on these things. If you care about your employees, you know, and we always hear all these companies have values like trust and, you know, compassion and inclusion, or even going so far to say we're a family, which is its own thing. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I have uh, thoughts on that as well for another time. <laughs> not saying that that's a healthy alternative, but I think that, you know, the, A lot of these companies have been around for decades, maybe even centuries, and the fundamental company values shouldn't be compromised because they don't want to take a stand on a partisan issue, period. If you care about your employees and you live up to your company's mission and everything that you've always said you stand for, you shouldn't have to worry about that. You should be there to defend and, you know, (laughs) create space where everyone at your company feels like they belong, you know, feels represented and, and doesn't have to worry. Yes, completely, completely agree. Uh, So in your opinion, from your perspective, what does communicating like you give a damn look like or sound like? Yeah. Communicating like you give a damn to me, I think, it, it falls along the same lines of everything that we've been speaking about. Again, it's, you know, building long-term investment. Maybe you're not communicating about it all the time, but you have built whatever it takes to get to the impact you want to see. If you're saying you care about something, let's see what you've done to get, to get to a better place. Doesn't mean that you've solved the world's issues. Um, But, you know, we we need some continuity and maybe, you know, George Floyd is not in the headlines any longer. Maybe, you know, BLM is no longer as trendy as it was. But if you said that you were going to reinvest in black communities, you should still be doing that. And you should still be, you know, the work should be there. You should keep people updated, even if it doesn't mean that you're constantly releasing press statements because it's no longer a hot topic but it doesn't matter if people are watching. That's the point. And I think that's what makes it authentic and also the habitual piece, right? Communicate what exactly you're doing and the impact that you're having both to internal and external audiences. And like I said, you know, taking accountability um, and, and just being real about here's where we're at. We're not perfect. This is not for PR. This is not to, you know, CIA cover our asses. We're being honest about our flaws and the good things that we're doing because we care about this issue and it's not about making us as a company look good. It's about the people we say we stand behind. 
And that's really how we want the depth model to be used is to ground people in this authenticity. And the T tailored is specific to every organization's core capabilities. So everybody can do something to your earlier point. You're not, you don't, you can't solve all the things, but what is your business? What is your industry? Where do you have influence? Where do you have innovation? There, that's where you go. That's what you're about. And that's gonna, is gonna make you not only stand, but withstand. And I loved your examples. Thank you. So uh, there's so much more I could talk to you about. Maybe we'll have you back <laughs> because, you know, especially as we, you know, build up to uh, November, 2024. Um, really? But, you know, so how can, I mean, you're fascinating, you're into research. I'm always fascinated by research and what people are, what, what's, what the, the insights are from different kinds of research your DEI strategist, where can people can follow you and continue to learn from you? 100%. I am on LinkedIn, Miriam Khalifa, <laughs> just type it in. Um, and, and you will find me there, you know, talking about the importance of communications, going off about, you know, current events, new technology, you name it, um, but very much through a DEI lens and looking at you know, how is this impacting the folks that maybe aren't in the conversation and maybe are, are being overlooked by all the hustle and bustle? And you can also read my piece in The Conscious Communicator. If you don't have the book already, go get a copy. Get it. So, live in there <laughs> on these issues, you know, from Kim and other communications and DEI experts. Um, just a wealth of knowledge. So what are you waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. You really provide a very unique and, 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 and very valuable perspective to the book. So thank you again for your contribution and for trusting me because uh, you had no idea really what the book was about, but you wrote for it and you trusted uh, that it would be in context of your work. And, and then I hope people really see that the highlight of your work and, and your contribution to the book overall really is a, a tangible way of how communicators can start implementing this work within the organization. So thank you very much for that contribution. Thank you so much, Kim. It's, it's been an incredible opportunity to be a part of this work and, you know, to, to hear from all of these voices and just see some real momentum. You know, I, a lot of folks, this is kind of a hidden issue and it really is so important to get where we want to go. I'll echo, echo my daughter whenever she hits the high score on the video game she likes. Let's go. <laughs> Thank Love you, Miriam. Thank you, Kim. So what popped out to you from the conversation? The more conscious communicators in the world, the better the world. So go to communicate like you give a damn podcast.com and set up a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. And until next time, Let's keep taking care of each other.